groups of letters with a number in. You know, you might get a, a group, four letters with a number in. This was to test how fast you were. That's what you used to do all the time. You know. And uh, when I was training in the RAF, I found myself writing the things down without even thinking, you know. Mm. And then when you saw it came to, you'd miss a letter. The only time you missed a letter was when you tried to pay attention. It was so automatic, you could just write it straight down. Morse is finished now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So could you, uh, you could write it down, could you hear it and know what was being communicated? Oh, yeah. In your head as it was going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. And I, I could do that when I was in my prime, I could probably do it up to 24 words a minute. Still, <laughs> go through the alphabet, walk, going upstairs on the on the chair. I do it, press it, there's a handle there and I'm pressing it. Go through the alphabet. Send me a message on WhatsApp, because <laughs> mine does a bit of Morse code. What do you mean? No, I don't matter. Do it later. Well, well, I've got a little program mm. that we we communicate. Oh yeah. And like when I get a message, it does a bit of Morse code, and I was wondering what it was. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Should I do it? Well, I'm taping something. And then we've got WhatsApp on. Is that a tape recorder? Yeah. Good. Um... But when uh, when when that bloke gave me a rise of half a crown. How much is it today, half a crown? Twenty, uh, twelve and a half p. Yeah, I got another job at a dairy, a dairy, and the funny thing was the price of a gallon of milk was the same as the price of a gallon of petrol, so it didn't te test me much, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just the same recording. How many each person had taken or sold, you know. By that time, I'd been to uh, Padgate, I'd volunteered. Hang on, just let's work that out. So, a gallon of petrol was the same as a gallon of milk? Yeah, two and three items. So, <laughs> like, a gallon of milk now is about two quid, isn't it? Because you get those four pint thingies and they're a quid. Ooh, the four pints? Yeah, and a gallon's eight pints, isn't it? Eight pints and a gallon. Well, four pints, isn't it? But, yeah, but two of them. How much you said? A quid. Yeah, huh? that has oh, it. No, no, it's uh, it's probably eighty five ninety for a two pounder. <laughs> right, all right. But compared to a gallon of, uh, well, they do it in litres anyway, so no one. No, no, gallon of petrol is no. no, but that they were two and three eighths a gallon, both of them. So tell us about how, how like you started preparation to join the RAF, Dad. What, what, how did that... You, you were doing the AT thing. I was in the ATC. I mean, that was just a voluntary thing. People, it, it was you, the people, the lads that wanted to go in the RAF, you know. And uh, they started... A, there were so many in it, they started a second squadron of ATC in Preston. And as it was nearer, I moved to uh, this new one. And there, there was a teacher, the headmaster, that was the squadron commander. Been the teacher that was squadron commander of the other one as well. I think this one, the new one, was deputy at the first one. And uh, I, I was a, a corporal for a long time. And but the thing was, I was too far in advance of all the rest of them. And it was, I used to work in the office, you know, keeping records again. Mm. And uh, we'd go to uh, camps, RF stations. We did a bit of gliding at Blackpool. Never got off the ground, but you did a ground slide, you to keep the wings up, you know, mm -hmm. rather than slide. Uh, as far as we got in that, but uh, I was uh, 
a sergeant when I left the ATC. But I'd always intended, I mean, I can't think when I first thought, oh, what a F, yeah. But uh, I, I volunteered when I could, when I was 17 and a quarter. I was perhaps a bit older, but I had to go to uh, Padgate, RF station, and you were tested for all these different things. I, I think uh, for, for wireless operator they sent out not any specific letters, but to say whether they were same or different, you know, a series of dots and dashes, and is it the same as that? <coughs> Sorry. And uh, I don't think they were taking pilots at that time. And pilots usually, were, if, if you were accepted for pilot, it was pilot or navigator, you know. But uh, I was accepted as a wireless op air gunner. And uh, was that disappointing to you at the time? Well, it was, it was, but uh, I, I think I understood, you know. I mean, it was 1943. And, uh, Were they kind of selecting people for different posts within... Uh, within well, for uh, different trades, you can call right, it. Right, yeah. Mm. But, uh, and they're going to just have to sit and fire a gun. But the wireless rock is a bit more to do. And uh, they hadn't got uh, flight engineers at that time. It came in shortly after flight engineers. So there was pilot, navigator, wireless rock, air gunner. And uh, a wireless rock usually got trained as in gunnery as well. But that changed before I actually got in. I just did uh, wireless. I got an S brevet signaler. But uh, what? So you 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 sort of went down to specialised training in in wireless operator. Yeah. And what did that consist of then? What was well, you you certainly got to know the Morse, and you got to be able to do fault finding on wirelesses, radios, mm. you know, learn which valve you could do without or which, could you swap one over and things like that. You had uh, two kinds of radios, one was long distance sort of thing and one was for lo more local. But uh, yeah, and direction finding and things like that. Things that were unheard of these days. Mm. You'd get uh, fixed from two different points mm -hmm. so that you knew where you were. So that was, that was, well, the Sox job. Taking instructions. But I, I, I joined up in 1943. Well, I, I, I was actually in from when I went to Padgate, I was thrown in then, and uh, I was put on deferred service, and uh, I was eight, I turned 18 in June and went in August, 43, and I had to report to Lord's Cricket Ground. So had you done all the, the, the kind of basic training, all the drilling and all this, like... In the ATC, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you had a little advantage of that. So when you went to Lord's Cricket Ground to join up, was that the point at which, like, you were given your uniform and started sleeping in barracks, or did you do that? I mean, was that the way it was? Oh, no, no. No, I mean, you, you joined up, you were, in, you were in the... There were no barracks as such, but... That was your life then, wasn't it? You know, I mean, ATC, it was something or nothing really. I mean, people joined the RAF and air crew and had never been in the ATC. I mean, it didn't mean anything that. Mm. It just gave you a little advantage when you did yeah. go in. 
So where did, where did you go once you joined in? What uh, joined in? Joined up? Where did you? What were you living? They brought to Lord's Cricket Ground, and we were billeted in posh flats that had been taken over. That had won prizes for the architecture. And I can't think of the name of the road, Prince Edward Road or something. It's like a one of the roads out of London, and it was near the zoo, near Regent's Park Zoo. And we we're in these. I, I, I often wonder how many were there at the time. You you were there for a month. You got your uniform and your medicals and your jabs and things like that. And. Our dining hall was the restaurant at the zoo. We used to march from the flats that we were in. And what was your sleeping arrangements? There? Oh, we were in these flats. No, but like, we, did you share a room or were you... Oh, there were perhaps four or five in the room. Yeah. Yeah. You got your bed space. <laughs> you had to keep your bed space clean. And uh, our, our medical centre was Abbey Road. Mm. I often wonder, it was just called Abbey Road and that place is called Abbey Road. Mm. I just wonder whether there was two <coughs> parts or whether it was actually the same place or not. <coughs> but I know, for some reason, when I got one jab I felt faint or something. I must have looked as I felt. And they put, sent me out through the back door to get some fresh air. And, when you go out to the back door, you, you're in Regent's Park nearly. So that's that's where we were, and you, you weren't allowed out till you were supposed to be able to wear your uniform properly and all that business. And I think after a fortnight, you were allowed out. And the first night, the first day you're allowed out was a Saturday. What was the discipline like, Dad? I mean, were you being shouted at all the time? Or no. What? No, not really. Not, I mean, at this stage, it was just recruitment thing, really. And as I say, you, you just got your uniform, you'd been issued with everything. And uh, you weren't allowed out. And the first day I was allowed out, I went to Watford to this cousin of mine, where I'd been at before the war started. And uh, we had a pint or two and went to a school dance. I think it was a school dance, although Frank, I spoke to him a few years, a couple of years ago, he couldn't remember. We went to this school dance. And having had a few, I was throwing this girl about, you know, jitter booking. <laughs> it was only when I was going, I noticed she had a club foot. <laughs> She was a teacher at the school. <laughs> and then you I thought was, she was a lousy dancer. <laughs> <laughs> I was a lousy dancer. But I was laid back and I, oh, I thought I was going to get sacked, you know. And he had to report to this room in this block of flats. The flight sergeant there. And he said, real stern, you know, big quivering. Where have you been? Watford flight. Whereabouts? I said, do you know it? <laughs> he said, whereabouts? I said, Vickery's Road. Too near my bloody wife, keep away. <laughs> so that was the discipline. <coughs> but from there, <coughs> went, went to Bridge North, Shropshire. And that was the initial training when, it's when you start doing square bashing. And uh, the flight sergeant there was an ex-guardsman, so that's the sort of person you were dealing with there. That was discipline. And what were you in barracks type situation? Huts. Yeah. Yeah, this was. And what would a day consist of? Well, I think we started doing <coughs> moors and things like that. 
Only moss. I can't think really. Must have done something it can't be drilling all the time. But the funny thing was that when I got to this place, I got an ingrowing toenail. And uh, I went to see the camp chiropodist. Nice lass she was, a corporal. And uh, it was septic and it wouldn't heal. Now this is 1943, end up. And we never got antibiotics then. It was for urgency, antibiotics mm. then. So I was sent to a, a place, a sort of nursing home. Uh, and uh, I, I was waiting for it to heal, you know, so they could take the till what, and toenail off. That's all it was. And we, while we were there, you were allowed into Wolverhampton on a, a Tuesday, I think it was. Just one day you were allowed there. And we had to wear hospital blue. You know hospital blue. No. Well, it's a, a blue flannel that it f feels and looks like flannel. Blue suit, white shirt, red tie, your own cap. In your own footwear and uh, so on a Tuesday we'd go into Wolverhampton. Why Why did you have to wear uh, like... <laughs> I've no idea why. I've no idea. It was the uh, same all the way through. Hospital blue. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what effect it had. We went into Wolverhampton one Tuesday and what we used to do was go to the pictures and uh, we went into one this particular Tuesday and it was a Vera Lynn made a film and it was terrible so what you did you came out because they let you in free and uh, you go to another place you know see if there were a better film on and then we meet up. Why did like you in free if you were, was it a hospital? I'm not or, sure if it was the hospital office. blue or if you were in the forces. Yeah. But this this part I'm coming to is definitely one of them. We we used to go in this uh, forces canteen which was above Burton's tailors. And this particular time about nine of us were meeting up after we'd been to wherever we would be. And we were sitting at a big table and we just had a spam butty and a, a mug of tea, you know. And uh, we had to be back for half past seven. We'd have to catch a bus at about half past seven or something to get back. And uh, a, a woman came and she said, Would you like a fish tea? She said, There's a lady behind the counter who'd like to buy you a fish tea, seeing as you wounded. I had an ingrowing to all <laughs> We thought you were all Some like... had had measles. <laughs> One bloke had actually had pneumonia. But everybody said, <laughs> seeing as you were wounded, she'd like to buy you a fish tea. <laughs> oh, I said, well, I said, we do have a bus to get. She said, we know that. She said, but it's ready if you'll have it. Oh, I said, well, thanks very much. <laughs> so we had a fish tea. <laughs> and it was good fish as well. Because we were wounded. <laughs> but when I went back, I, I, I had an opera, big operation to get this toenail off, you know. And uh, oh, while I was in, I don't know how long I was in, I was in a few days. Uh, we got a new medical orderly. And, they were really nurses, you know, but they just transferred from being, you know, plotters, moving planes mm -hmm. about on the mount. There were two of them came, and she'd worked with uh, Guy Gibson, Dan Bolson. Mm -hmm. So she'd been a a plotter on the Dan Bolson's thing, and she was Irish.
So you you your toenail recovered? Oh yeah. Well, uh, it, I've been out out of form for so long. I I couldn't go back to the same squad because they were more advanced. Right. I was what they call ET, the extra training. So I've, I I joined up with another lot, and uh, that's where I met Taffy Dinner. And uh, where was this back in London? Oh no, this is at Bridging Hall. Oh, All right, yeah, Bridgenhall. yeah, yeah. And it it was only a, I think it was only a two month course, but I'd start it again. And then when the course was finished, we went to a radio school then. I went to Madley, near Hereford. And they signed on so many aircrew because they were losing them at a fantastic rate that e even then they employed too many for what were being shot down. Mm. Well, what were you thinking? I mean, because like, the, the mortality rate was high. No, this is the funny thing about it. It is absolutely, I mean, I think about it now. <coughs> if I'd been a year older, I'd have been on operations. If I had, I'd have had a 50-50 chance of living. Yeah. And I knew this. You knew that then? We did it. didn't know 50-50, but we certainly knew a hell of a lot of women yeah. being killed. And, and uh, I mean, what did you think of that? I mean, I don't know. It's daft. That's what I mean. It's daft, isn't it? I've only thought of it recently. If I'd been a year older, I'd, I'd have had a fit. And if I'd been a year younger, I could have been at uh, the D-Day landings. Because mm. I might not have got in the RAF if I'd been a year old, younger. Mm -hmm. So being born in 1925 <laughs> was a good thing, really. You know, we were in a tr on a train once, I think we were going on leave, and there were a few of us coming up to uh, this area. And we got in a, a, a compartment on the train, and there was an RAF officer in there. And uh, while we were training, we used to wear white flashes in there. And, you know. So whether we were at that stage, or whether we were, we'd passed out and had tapes. I think probably we were still in the light flash there. And this, uh, he said, he'd say, why, why do you want to be in air crew? He said, he said, they're going down like flies. What was, he, what was his position? He was an officer. In the? In the RAF. Right. I don't know in what area or anything, but. Do you think you were just like kids and not, not seeing it as a kind of, well, young young men, but like not seeing it as like a reality? Well, there were a hell of a lot that did, weren't it? Really? I mean, I suppose some joined up not knowing that, <laughs> thinking they always came back. Thinking what? Thinking they always came back from air raids. But 50% didn't. 50% died. Mm. Terrible. I mean, you, you, you sometimes see people on television and they've done two tours or three tours. Two tours was 60 odd operations. That's a miracle. Mm -hmm. And to do three, yeah. mm. you, you could go out on your first operation and not come back. Mm. In fact, more likely, I suppose, in experience and so mm. More likely to. It could be your first, because you're inexperienced and that sort of thing. Because your whole crew would probably be the same. There was a, a stage in your training where you went to this place to meet up with all the other Veterans. pilots and what have you, and you'd sort of form cliques. And that would be your crew, you know, you'd get on with the you get on with each other, and it, mm. that's how you got into a crew. So you were pretty matey before you went on any operations, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, I mean, we weren't needed, which was, you get grateful for these days. I volunteered for other things, I volunteered for 
while I was in and nothing was happening, I volunteered for Coastal Command. What was that? that? What was that? Well, they were flying in flying boats, searching for U-boats and things. I don't know if they needed more, I don't know. Never heard another thing about it. So we'll see to give her a bit of back to him, just for a little minute. Just look at it. Look at you. I'm just looking at that time, does that mean 27 minutes is what's left? Oh, I'm wrong. I don't know, probably what's left. Well, if it goes to 26, it's what's left. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, what, what happened then, Dad? You, you were waiting in Bridge North for... Well, I turned the train then Bridge North for... for Initial training, like square bashing, as they call it. Radio school at Madly near Hereford. Then we went to, for a, for a bit of variety, they sent us to Yatesbury to another radio school. Same thing. And there were those that were still at Yatesbury that had trained at Yatesbury, just done the same as us doing the course over and over again. And one of them, in the in the Yatesbury law, uh, he played football. You know, a, a lot of football, well, most of the footballers played as guests for other teams. Like Matthews was a Stoke player, but he played for Blackpool as a guest because he was stationed at Blackpool. Oh, that's how it worked. Yeah. And they got ten bob a match. And he also played for Arsenal. He must have been stationed down there for a little time. Mm -hmm. And while we were at Yatesbury... Was the Football League still going on then? It wasn't. It was the War Cup. It war, the War Leagues. They were regional leagues. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, in fact, Preston had to drop out because they North End's ground was used as a prisoner of war camp or something. They played a few matches on Lale and Motors ground. Mm. But, I mean, that didn't work. So, Preston didn't play after 1942, I think. Mm. Till he was getting near the end of the war. But, uh, this, uh, at Yatesbury, Matthews was guesting for Arsenal and this bloke in the Yatesbury lot played for Millwall, left full back, direct opposition to the right winger, mm -hmm. who we knew was going to be Stanley Matthews. So they worked a flanker to get him out without them knowing because he had to go on the Friday. So he sort of absconded on the Friday morning and he covered up for him. In order that he could play against Stanley Matthews. So he could play against Stanley Matthews. And he, he, he played a blinder apparently and it was in all the papers which were read by the mm. <laughs> commanding officer. <laughs> How did he get there? Mm -hmm. And he didn't get back till the Monday. Mm -hmm. And it was, he was straight in, in front of the officer. And what did they do? What, what? I got you. I mean, it, it was only, uh, you know, I told off. It was really serious, you know, mm -hmm. but he was hauled up, you know, told off. But he'd had his day facing Stanley Matthews. George Fisher, he was called. Don't know if he ever played after the war. I think he did. There were two of them, though. <coughs> two brothers. And then I was, they decided to send us on an air grubbery course, although they didn't do the both at that time. They decided to send, it was all time, passing time on. And the gunnery course was on the Isle of Man. And uh, we were there, I don't know when we went there, but I was there on VE day. And uh, we were we were in Douglas on May the eighth. 
Uh, so, w were you like looking at the progress of the war and maybe thinking, you know, I'm not going to get a, a, an opportunity to do anything? Well, I think like, by that time you're thinking, <laughs> be home soon. Right. You know, I think, I don't know. Because uh, we, we, we'd really been doing nothing except waste time. The good I mean, we had, I can remember flying around the coast of the Isle of Man in Wellingtons. And. Uh, so when did you end up in Singapore or whatever? Well, well I've gone to that, I've never <laughs> finished there. Uh, I was, we were flying around the Isle of Man pretty low, and I was in the rear turret, and they called it air to sea. All you're doing was firing the, these guns off into the sea, and there were five of us up there to, have to go through this exercise. Four of them said, we don't want to do it, will you do it? So I did the lot, and going round the Isle of Man, low high, shooting these things, and we suddenly f flew over a trawler. <laughs> and I can, imagine, I can imagine the hooter going and zigzagging. I mean, it came underneath, you know. Oh, right, yeah. So you were just firing the gun, yeah, like, yeah, all of a sudden. Yeah. I mean, he flew over it, so obviously, at speed, it just got up and before I could take my thumbs off. Anyway, I didn't hear anything about that. Another thing that happened on the Isle of Man was uh, we'd met two ATS girls, Taffy Dinham and myself, and we were with them on Douglas Head near the lighthouse, and some kids kept throwing pedals, you know. And it was like a bit of a game we were chasing them. And, but uh, when th things had gone quiet and they'd gone, one of them came back and says, so and so has fallen down, he's not moving, he'd fallen off the cliff. And uh, it was a Tuesday when we had to be there, uh, when our day off was, when we were in the Alan, uh, in Ramsey, in Douglas. We were stationed up at the north of the island. And uh, so we had to carry him up and the, the lighthouse keeper wasn't there and his wife was hopeless. Oh, don't let him see anything. Anyway, the lad died, so... When how, far, how far had he fallen, then? I don't know how far the cliff had been. Perhaps 100 feet or something like that. Was he still alive? No, he was dead, really. He did, he did a lump on his head, like the size of the head. God. He was a mess. I mean, he was probably dead then. Hmm? He was probably dead then. But we took him into the lighthouse. How old was he? I think about nine or ten. Oof. And uh, she said, do, do what you want. I, I, I can't look, you know. So we, he, he, we put him on the bed and got an ambulance, you know. And uh, we had to make a statement to the police. Where were the other kids at this point in time? Well, we had... I don't... I don't know whether he made a statement at the scene of where they went to the police station. I think we went up to the police station. Uh, and we, we got uh, a note from them to say we'd missed the last thing back up to Andreas, to Ramsey. So we stayed the night. And when we got back in the morning, um, there were we got as far as the guard room and we were told that one of us had to go back straight away for the inquest. So Taffy Dinham went, got nine shillings. Mm. We split it. Mm? We split it, four and six each. So what communication did you have with your family, your, your mum and your dad at this time? Oh, well, it was only writing letters. Just laughing because I, I got one from my dad every pancake Tuesday. <laughs> was that the only time you got one from your dad? About one a year. <laughs> but I got, got a lot from my mother. Kept writing. 
But the thing is, what well, was Uncle John and, and the, re the other kids doing at this time? You know, they're at school. Well, John was. John was eight and a half years younger than me. Uh, but being in air crew, you, you got leave every five weeks, not every three months. Hmm. If you did, you, if you did a, a certain amount of flying, got so many flying hours in. Mm -hmm. You got a, a week's leave every five. five so weeks. what would you be doing? Would you be like flying on practice, practicing yeah. all the time? Yeah. Like that? yeah. You, you, while you're at, at radio school, you'd be in the classroom for Morse and and uh, fault finding on radios and so on. And then you'd do air exercises. And you'd go up and send a few messages and receive. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult that because if you got a bit away from the uh, aerodrome, you couldn't hear properly. It was terrible. So what you had to do was fight to get in, get your hospitals away before anybody else. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you could manage to get it done on the ground before you took off. <laughs> Just outside the building, you know, that was all right. And then take off and just relax, just fly around for an hour or two. What? So you, the the what you had to do was send a signal back to the base. Yeah, you send and receive. Yeah, yeah. And just mm -hmm. an exercise. And yeah. then once you'd done it, you you had nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if if you took off and you'd t f flown away from the place, you know. Say a quarter of an hour, you're well away. You get having a job here in what the what the mm -hmm. dots and dashes are. Mm. So it was always advisable to if you could get get it done before you took off. It was brilliant, mm -hmm. and that 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 was uh, we were flying in. Well, we did, we flew a bit in uh, De Havilland eighty six Bs. You, you'll see them quite a lot in the early days of civil aviation. De Havilland, 86 Bs. Well, they had the name Dragon Rapide. They took five passengers for us then. Uh, but they used them to the Isle of Man for ages, even after the war. And uh, we also flew in Proctors, where just one of you had been. Um, it was just a pilot and you, you know, with your radios. So, tell us about Singapore then. How did you get there? What well, was there? when the war finished, VE Day, I was in the Isle of Man, and we finished the course, and then they sent us home. And they sent us a telegram not to go back. And sent us a ration book and money. We were on sort of long leave. Yeah, they yeah. didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. It was still going on in Japan, wasn't it? Oh, it's still going on in Japan, yeah. Until September. In fact, I was... I don't know actually when I did start that leave. It wasn't immediately after the 8th of May. And VJ Day in August, 15th of August, I was, uh, all the rest of the family were going on holiday. So, so you know, like when VE day, mm. what was your kind of thing? Like, Thank God for that, I missed it. <laughs> or what? Or were you just like, you know, well, we or, or what? <laughs> Not bother going back. No, I don't, I don't, I don't think we missed it. I never thought that. Was there a relief that like, you know, that, that... Well, I mean, it was coming, you know, I mean, it'd been coming from months really hadn't it? Mm. So I mean it was only progression. It didn't come as a surprise or anything. Mm. So had uh, had the like leading up to that particular day, mm. was there a kind of thing like right, any day now we're gonna we're gonna formally yeah. Yeah. end the the, yeah. the war? 
who will get to Berlin first and things like that. Was that was that everybody like right? That'll be it. it. You know, if we get Hitler or like we we t take over Berlin, you know, get the Reichstag or whatever. That well, that think, marks the end. Well, I suppose so. Yeah, but I mean, uh, I think we're getting worried as the Russians then. Right. And because they were, they, they weren't as cute as they thought they were. You know, trying to get there first. And what did, were people already thinking? Uh, yeah, well, I think so, yeah. Because Patton wanted to go carry straight on, didn't he? You know, he said, well, let's go for Russia. <laughs> Rather than stopping at Berlin, I think. Well, he was a madman, wasn't he, really? So it was like, it, it, the end, the, was it 8th of May, is it? 8th of May. Was that like... That's that was when it was declared over. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they were meeting up, weren't they? Russian and Yanks mm. mating and English and Russians mating. But then... Was Hitler dead by... How long had Hitler been dead by the time of VE? Well, we didn't know he was dead till after, but he died end of April, didn't he? So, right. 29th of April, so I think. I don't think we knew he was dead. What's his name? Was Admiral Dernitz was supposed to take over. But for VJ Day in August, our family had booked a holiday and I was still on leave, so I went with them to not what, what did you uh, What did you think of when you heard the news about the bombs, but the atom bombs being dropped? How did that kind of emerge? Yeah, well, we didn't know anything about that, you know, in advance about an atom bomb. I think I got to know when it had been dropped. I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the mood in the in the world, really? I mean, well, I think it was understood that it was to shorten the war. But, they like, were... but just the, the enormity of like a weapon like that. Mm. What, what what did was it was like, oh, good, we've got a good one there then, or, or the, the, the implications kind of... Uh... Good job the Germans never got one, mm -hmm. and things like that. I don't know, I can't remember really. It was, it was like, an enormous novelty sort of thing. I mean, to me, I, I'd never known that there was one in the office, you know, that's me. Was the country, was there kind of in, in the newspapers, on the tele or the radio, did they say, wow, you know, or was it like, you know, it's just killed 100,000 people in one go, <laughs> or, what, or was it, the war's over, we've, we've done I think, that? I think it was, well, the war's over. I mean, it must have come out about how many, you know, how many, how far away it could be and get killed, you know, that sort mm. of thing. Because there were prisoners there as well. Yeah. English prisoners. Uncle Frank was a prisoner, my Uncle Frank. And I could never figure it out. We've been to Fulwood Barracks where he was based. And there's, they're lacking in their... Uh, they couldn't show us. He wasn't in a book of prisoners of war. The thing was, he was kept at Changi Jail in Singapore. What was that? A door. And, and, uh, Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Seven minutes left. Come on! Seven minutes. Well, we're running out of time now, so we'll let... Oh. We'll, go okay. on, just tell us about Uncle Frank and then... Oh, well, he was... He, he, the rest of the battalion went to Japan, or Taiwan. Richard, I think. I was Frank. I was Frank? Yeah. Oh. What other Frank is it? <laughs> I thought you were talking about brother no. Frank. No. And we, we went trying to find... We were doing the family tree thing, Pauline went and John. And he wasn't in the... There was a book about the, the prisoner of war and he wasn't in it. 
Mm. He went, he was a re regimental sergeant major when he was taken prisoner, I think, or he might have been lieutenant. But he, he got his promotions while he was in there. So he was captain when he came home. Well, they continued promoting people oh, yeah. while they were... Yeah. Uh, how did you acquire like that length of service or something? Yeah, I suppose so. And through to, I mean, he'd been in since a boy. Mm -hmm. My granddad joined as a boy, his dad. Hey, is something going on? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Come in here! Come on! <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> Well, why don't you say you're in here? We did! He said, like, like, come on in! I didn't hear that, well, I would have done if I'd heard that. Oh! Come in! Oh. We're coming out now. So, you're going to have some dinner. Yeah, I'm starving now, Mum. Are you fat, Mish? Go on then. He came home. Oh. Oops. He was as fat as ever. <laughs> you were. He kept, by the time he came, well, when I saw him, he was as fat as... Uh, do you know? He was what? The first thing he did when, he, when I met him, when he came home, play out with me about the shortage of aircraft in Singapore. Oh. I said, oh, it wasn't my job. Have you not him before, <laughs> then? I mean, what are you doing in that room, anyway? <laughs> Filming. Huh? Oh, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Play hell with me about an huh? F cover in Singapore. Yeah. I mean, I come and I said you had the guns line. facing the wrong way. They did, you know. They had the they had big, big guns facing out to sea. Yeah, and they yeah. came down the down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that brings us to the end of the war. We'll pick up at this. Uh, well, it doesn't really. All oh, right. But you can carry on some other. Yeah. Because well, when we come the, down for the wedding, will uh, the war? Fit, well, it does big come to the end of the war, really. Because it was after the war, mm -hmm. when they finally found somewhere for us to go, and I did a course in uh, pay accounts, and I was a pay accounts clerk. And how old were we at this point, Dad? Twenty-one. Yeah. Well, the war finished in forty-five. Oh, I was twenty in forty-five. Yeah, yeah. And it, it was a. Uh, January 46, by that time I'd trained as a pay accounts clerk and I was posted to Hong Kong to an airfield construction squadron. They were going to make, construct an airfield mm -hmm. on the mainland. Mm -hmm. But uh, the locals wouldn't work on it because it was paddy field land or something, you know, taking their livelihood. So I was in Hong Kong for about four or five months doing nothing there. The only time I, well, I got posted back to Singapore who, was Hong Kong. What was Hong Kong's status? Was it like a protectorate of the British Empire? Yeah, yeah. And we just like went along and said, right, we're going to build a, a, an airport here. Well, I mean, we had it for a certain, oh, course, wait, by agreement for a yeah, certain yeah. length of time. Yeah, yeah. That time ran out when Patton was there to do the handle. Yeah. We went back to China. Yeah. And it's the same with Macau, that, I think that was Portuguese. Another island nearby, Macau. Mm. Must have been 1897, something like that, 1997, something like yeah. that. Yeah. 100 year lease, mm. weren't it? Mm. Yeah. But uh, I can't find my way around I think Hong Kong now. Out. I think it's flashing finish now. You're going to have to lift me up here. You're going to stop that? Yeah.